Morning, church. How are we? Yeah, y'all enjoying this Christmas Eve or Christmas? Ah, already there. Uh, New Year's Eve. Yeah, everybody so far. Yeah, awesome. Hey, why don't y'all uh, let's let's stand up? We're uh, we're preaching on the Magi today, so I figure you know I saw the light It'd be a fantastic way to kick this service off. Y'all think so? Yeah. All right. Well, get your get your hands ready to be clapping, and uh, it's so wonderful to uh, to gather with everybody this morning. So here we go. One, two, three, four. I've wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Here we go. in darkness. I've walked in darkness and clouds covered me. I had no idea where the way I would be. Then came the sunrise and rolled back the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears I claim for my own. And like a blind man who got me back his side. Praise the Lord, I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light, oh I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Amen, amen. Jesus, you're beautiful, you're so wonderful, and we love to praise you. You are indeed our light. We love you, Father. Grateful are we in worship. Grateful that he covers us.
Methodist Church Midlothian. Happy New Year's Eve. So we're uh, so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, and thank you for being here for our, our one worship service here on New Year's. Uh, we do this every year. We've done the last few years. Every time we're right around New Year's. Uh, one, because it's great every once in a while just to get the church together for one big worship service. It's also nice to give all of our servant teams who do AV and put slides together and everything to give them a little bit of time off. And so uh, we thank you for accommodating them. Uh, I want to just give a thank you to our AV team, everyone who does anything in worship, because we have a number of people who serve to make worship happen. So the slides you see being changed on screens, being put on screens, um, you, the fact you're hearing my voice uh, is the fact that we have a number of people who come to get see. <laughs> May you, we, we better give them a big thank you, all right? So, um, yeah. So grateful for y'all, and thank you for doing your job. So uh, we appreciate you, and just are grateful that you're here. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, man, we're so glad you chose to, I guess, we'll end the year and start the new year with worship with us. And so thank you for, for being here. I'm I didn't know if I introduced, I'm Pastor Brady Johnston, so uh, it's good, good to meet you and to see you out here. Um, so we're going to invite our kids to come up front and to meet us as they get ready for godly play. I know you'll have an amazing story today, so come, come on up. All right. Good to see all of y'all. 
How many of you are ready for a new year? Huh? Uh, a few of us? Okay. All right. You have five there? All right. All right. Well, good. Awesome. All right. Well, good. Well, hey, we're going to have a prayer as we get ready for godly play. Can y'all put your hands together? All right. God, we thank you so much for worship, for the chance to come together and to hear about Jesus, to celebrate Jesus and all that he is and all that he has done for us. We pray that you go with our children. May your spirit guide them as they worship, that they could hear the good news of Jesus. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. All right, y'all go with Miss Keeley. as we continue in our worship um, this is our, our song uh, it's just devoted to just being with the Lord uh, we have praised him, we have worshipped him, we have lifted him high and so now is our time of preparation as we get ready for the, the message that's to come and to open the word of the Lord after in this song if you want to stand and sing you can do that if you want to come to the front altars you can do that uh, if you want to stay in your seat and just pray you can do that as well. This is our time just to be with Him. God, open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts. We want to worship. So sing away in a manger. Away in a manger, no crib for a man. The little Lord Jesus lay down His sweet head. Sleep on the head. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, the dawn of salvation.
you join me in prayer, church? Jesus, we love you so much. And God, we, take, we just take this moment to settle ourselves and to settle in for what you have for us this morning. God, please open our eyes uh, to what you desire for us. Um, where you lead, we will follow. And Father, we anticipate this new year. Um, we know that it's just a time mark in our minds and that you have continued to do what you do best uh, for centuries and centuries before us and you will continue to do it well after us. And so Father, in this moment, we just take we take these things that we have and these things that we celebrate and they're wonderful and they're good, but we submit them to you, God, because you make them amazing. And so, Lord, right now, would you hear our hearts, hear our minds, our thoughts, our prayers, everything submitted to you, Lord. And would you speak back to us your will and your desire? Would you awaken in us your gifts, your desires, the tools you have given us to see your kingdom come. And so, Father, we thank you that as we gather here, Lord, you are strengthening us with your word, with your worship. In all these things, Father, we have you to thank. We worship you, Jesus. Hallowed Father, we love you. And so it's with this in mind that we lift up this prayer that you taught us long ago. So we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, it's great to see you here today. If you have your Bible, you're invited to turn with us to Matthew chapter 2. We're, we're celebrating Epiphany a, a little early uh, this, this year. One reason we're doing that is that we're starting uh, our, our year off with, with what um, has part of a tradition in the Methodist Church uh, called the Wesleyan Covenant Service. And so we'll be doing that next week at, our, at all three of our worship services on the 7th. And so we'll be celebrating the Wesley Covenant Service. And what it is is basically a time of, of starting the year with the right focus um, upon our call to grow in grace in Jesus Christ and to serve Him. And it was something that Wesley started in his ministry as the Methodist movement was going and, and was a, a powerful thing and a mark on, on Methodists for a long time. And so we'll celebrate that next week. And, and so we're doing Epiphany today. So don't tell our children because they are very strict about the, the worship calendar because of godly play. And so um, that's, that's our secret today. Uh, but we're looking at the Magi, and really we're going to look at what is the majority of the story today in Matthew chapter 2. And this is the continuation of the story we looked at last week. Uh, all throughout Advent, we've been looking at the stories of the people leading up to Jesus' birth, namely that of Zechariah and Elizabeth and then Mary, and, and of course Joseph being a part of that story as well. Uh, we celebrated on Christmas Eve last Sunday the birth of Jesus, and here we are looking at the story that comes now out of Matthew's Gospel um, about what took place after Jesus' birth. And so uh, let's turn our attention to the Word of God, uh, to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. 
But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw this child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every time we get to the story of the Magi, there's one question that tends to kind of come out, and that's, who were these guys? And, and if you've followed, um, you know, beyond the scriptures and read about this or watched the Smithsonian or History Channel, you'll, you'll find there's a number of legends about who the Magi are. Um, and what I'll say about their identity is that there's really a, a lot of mystery when it comes to understanding who these men were. Um, if I'm giving my best guess, um, I, I would believe that this is a tribe of priests from Persia. That's where I'm putting, pushing my cards in on, on this one. And I'll tell you why, for, for two reasons. Uh, one of them, we know that they came from the east, is one of the details that Matthew gives us of them. And the most significant, most influential um, empire out east was the Persian Empire. And so that's number one. And number two, the reason I think it, they, were, they were a tribe of priests from Persia is that they were familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures. So in 586 B.C., we know the Babylonians came into Jerusalem and they conquered the Hebrew people. And they conquered Jerusalem, they tore down the temple, and they brought most of, about half of the people, uh, of the Hebrew people, they brought into exile back to Babylon. And forced them into a harsh journey. Many of the influential people in in Jerusalem, uh, they brought back into exile. And the the Hebrew people were in exile for over 70 years. And, And at that time, the Persian Empire came and conquered the Babylonians. And when the Persians got to Babylon, they freed the Hebrew people and said, you can go back to your homeland if you so desire. Um, And many of them went back home, but many of them chose to stay because they had already built a life for themselves there in Babylon and there was no temple for the priests to return to. And so with this remnant here in Babylon, as the Persians began to, to influence the city, it makes sense that the learned people, this tribe of priests from, from Persia, would, would set up camp and actually recruit in their group a former priest, Hebrew priest, priests of the temple to come and help them gather knowledge of of their culture and their religion and their beliefs about God and about the world. Um, And so, to me, of of all the ones, this this makes the most sense because they come to, to learn of the prophecy of the Messiah so much so that when they see the star, they recognize and they go and they pursue. We find in, in the story that um, while there is some mystery to their identity, um, and some of us I know, we, we may not like mystery, we like things to be solved. The way Matthew tells the story, it's not the identity of the Magi that are the most significant part of the story. It's actually the identity of the one they've come to worship. That's what Matthew's most concerned with. And that's what he holds out there for you and I to be looking at here in Matthew chapter 2. And and we see as the Magi continue their journey, they arrive in Jerusalem looking for this one born king of the Jews. 
And they go to Jerusalem because there's no other place you would go to look for a king than the place where the king lived. And so they go to the house of the reigning king, King Herod, to find this one, his, whom they probably thought child that was born king of the Jews, who would succeed Herod. And it turns out that this is a deadly mistake. Uh, and it's deadly because of, of who Herod was and the kind of king that Herod was. And, and a little backstory on, on Herod, and we went over this several years ago, um, finds Herod as both a, a cruel and terrible figure in history, but also a really fascinating one. Um, Herod's story starts off with his father giving him uh, the right to be governor over Galilee. And so that's kind of his entrance into the political scene. And it's there when he's in the region of, of Galilee that he makes fast friends um, with two names that perhaps you've heard before. Uh, one, Mark Antony and Julius Caesar, made famous by the assassination and the pizza company. So... Well, not long after they became friends, um, Julius Caesar was assassinated. And when Julius Caesar was assassinated, he left everything to his adopted son, Octavian. And with this void figure occupying power over the Roman Empire, um, Julius Caesar's assassins began to try and take Caesar's power. Well, Mark Antony and Octavian came together and joined their military forces to fight against Julius Caesar's assassins. And ultimately they won. They killed every one of them. But instead of living happily ever after, with this throne still waiting to be occupied, Octavian and Mark Antony, who'd played so well together for, for so long, um, had a falling out over what you would imagine, a girl. Yeah, a girl. Um, so it turns out, as, as a part of the, to solidify their partnership, Mark Antony had married Octavian's sister. But he promptly divorced her and left her for one Cleopatra. And so Octavian and Mark Antony began to go to war together because that's how you solve your problems. And so they, they go to war, they fight against their forces, but what it leaves is Herod, who had befriended both Mark Antony and Octavian, it left him with the choice of who, who do you pick? And so, so he, Herod, chose Mark Antony and actually became a general in his army fighting against Octavian. And he won several notable battles there for, for Mark Antony. But if you know your history, you'll know that Herod, he picked the wrong pony, didn't he? Yeah, because eventually Mark Antony was destroyed, was killed at Actium by Octavian and his forces. After this significant battle in, in, in Actium, uh, Octavian, actually, he, he set up shop in a small island in a castle to, to try and plot his next steps of how he was going to eliminate the people who, were, who had opposed him. And as history will tell the story, and this is where it gets really interesting, as Octavian and his generals are planning how to hunt down the remaining people in opposition to him, of which Herod is at the top of the list. Herod walks through the doors. And he walks through the doors all the way up to Octavian and his generals. And he gets on his knees and he says to Octavian, you know I fought with my friend Mark Antony to the very end. And as I was faithful to him, so I will be faithful to you. And he kissed his hand. Can you imagine the nerve? Man, Octavian couldn't. He was just like speechless, like at this act of courage. And, and so instead of killing him, he promoted him. And, and he actually made him the ruler of Palestine, a place over which he was already familiar because he'd been governor of Galilee. And that's where we find Herod in the story. 
When Herod became ruler of Palestine, he, he built these magnificent structures. In fact, uh, the temple, which had been rebuilt, long been rebuilt at this point, he had added on to the temple and made it its most glorious it had ever been as far as size and beauty. He did a number of things to win the affections of the people, to win respect from the people, but that respect was never really given to him. And, and Mark, and, and though he was... Um, a ruler who, whose 32-year reign was marked by general peace in the area. Um, it was a peace that was achieved not by his kindness, um, but instead by his cruelty. Uh, and, and Herod was a kind of person who, who, when someone opposed him, he crushed them. In fact, we know as he got older and older, um, he became more and more paranoid that people were trying to take his throne. And just as an example of his cruelty, by the time of his death, Herod, in order to preserve his throne, will have ended up killing three of his sons, his wife, and most of her family, just to keep his power. And so the people, they saw this. And so you could imagine someone like that being in power and then finding news of a successor who has arrived on the scene. And so when Matthew says that Herod was disturbed, it's no coincidence that everyone else was disturbed because they know that heads are going to roll. And that's what they expect. And we find that as the Magi are going to, to, to find this, this Jesus and go and worship him, um, Herod sends them off to go as long as they come back and give him the news so that he too can go and worship, worship them, right? And the Magi, they, they go and, and they find Jesus and they go there and they, they worship him. But as the Magi deceive Herod, they, they leave, they go back to their country by another route. And we see once again, as we move past the story of the Magi into the next verses in 13 through 18, just an example of, of Herod's brutality. When Herod realizes that he's been fooled, He has his people, soldiers, go into, into Bethlehem area and kill all the children around the age of, of Jesus, two, around two years of age. Uh, we don't know how many, but given the population of Bethlehem and just statistics on, we think probably about 50 children he has murdered in order to preserve his throne. And, and that's the part of the story we tend to not read around Christmas a lot um, for good reason, because it's a tragic story. It's a horrible, horrible story and thought about, about what would happen here and why this would take place. But it's one of those stories that if we look within the details, we find not only hope, but we find something important about the identity of Jesus. The, the hope that's, that's found in this story is actually found in, tucked away in, in verse 18. As Matthew's reflecting on this tragedy of these children who were, were killed in, out of Herod's paranoia, um, he, he looks back to a prophecy from Jeremiah 31, who actually has its origins, whose story has its origins much earlier than that. But verse 18 reads, A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now this verse comes out with a backstory that goes all the way to Genesis chapter 35. In the story, Rachel is the wife of Jacob, and Rachel is having one of their children, and, and she's suffering in childbirth, and she knows that she's about to die. And so with her last breath, she, she names her son that she's given birth to, Ben 
Oni, which means son of my sorrows. After her death, her husband, Jacob, renames the child, gives the child another name, ben Jamin, which means son at my right hand, son of honor. And so we have here in Genesis 35, one child with two names, two very different names, son of sorrows and son at my right hand. Jeremiah will look at this story many years later and see that this story says something about the coming Messiah the Jews longed for and hoped for to come. This child with two names, two seemingly very different identities, as a son of sorrows and yet a son of glory at the right hand. And we don't know if in Genesis the people saw it. We don't know if Jeremiah really saw it. But, but what we know is in looking at the story and what Matthew is grabbing a hold of here is he's saying this, this name, this story, like it speaks to the dual life and ministry of Jesus. As the one who comes of sorrows and who comes at the right hand. The one who is the son of suffering and who is also the son of glory. And so right here, even before he does anything, we find the story of Jesus' life. We go through the Gospel of Matthew and we see the story unfold. We move toward the end and we receive the picture of of this son of sorrows hanging on a cross, suffering on our behalf. Isaiah looks at this scene envisioning the, this Messiah to come and he says in, in chapter 53 that he's crushed for our iniquities, suffering for you and me. But Matthew's gospel doesn't end with that doesn't end with a sign of, of defeat, but one, an image of glory. As we see this Jesus who was, was crushed to the point that he was put in a grave, we see him raised from the grave, raised to not only life, but poised at the end of the gospel to ascend in glory to the Father's right hand. And so this commentary in Matthew 2, like it tells the story of the rest of the gospel of this Jesus who entered into our sorrows to bear our sorrows upon him, but who is so glorious that eventually he will be raised to be at the Father's right hand where he reigns today in power. It's the story of the good news and the gospel right here for us. And this is the part of Advent, and the reason we have to tell this story, as difficult as parts of this might be, is because part of the season of Advent is not only a looking back, which gets most of our focus, isn't it? We look back to the night. Most of the sermons and the scriptures and the songs, they look back to the night in which Jesus came to us and entered um, this world. And rightfully so, it should. But so much of Advent for us is a looking forward of knowing this one who came to embrace our sorrows and did, even to the point of death and a cross, is also the son of glory who reigns even over the tragedies of our world today, even over the sorrows, and who will come again. And when he comes again, he'll bring his kingdom here upon the earth to make a new heaven and a new earth. And all the wrongs and the tragedies and sorrows we look at in the world and shake our heads that wrench our hearts like all those when this king comes again and establishes his reign in his glory. All those will come to an end. All the sorrows will come to an end and there will just be glory. Glory. That's the picture of Revelation 20. There's just glory in the end. 
And so there's something about the season and looking at the story and even the hard parts of it, just to realize and claim for us the hope that is ours and this one whom we've come to worship as king. And my hope and my prayer for you is whatever sorrows you, you, you bring here, whatever things in maybe your life or in the world that weigh heavy upon your heart, that we can come and before this story and before this one whom we know to be our glorious king, we can lay these down and claim again for us the hope that is ours and is the world's because of Jesus Christ. And so as we close in prayer, I invite you to pray with me. You can pray from your seat. You can come down and, and pray at the altar if, if you would like. But my hope is that in looking to this one who is both the son of sorrows and the son at the right hand, we can find the hope that is ours in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this story, this powerful story that tells us of the good news that is ours in Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus, having loved us and humbled himself, chose to enter into a world of sorrows. Who chose not to push away from tragedy. Who chose not because of His glory as your Son to be exempt from the tragedy and pain of this world, but instead with great courage chose to enter into it. And chose humbly to submit himself to death, even death on a criminal's cross. And the Gospels bear out the story and the reason behind this sacrifice. And it was because you so loved the world that you gave this Son, your most beloved Son to us, that we might through him have life when we come to believe on Him. And so we come here as an expression of our faith, of our trust in Jesus, that even as we face and are subject to our own sorrows and tragedies, that we look to Him as the one who reigns in glory. And while we await for the final culmination of that kingdom to come when He returns, we know that we see evidence of His glorious and wonderful reign even here today. We see it every time we're obedient to Him and serve His will. We see glimpses of how good it is when Jesus reigns in our hearts and in our world. So we pray that we would hear out of this word a call a call to go and be servants of Jesus in the world. To share the good news of the hope that is the world's because Jesus has come. That we would go and embody a love, your love, Father, that is, as Psalms 102 says, from everlasting to everlasting. And we pray that this movement initiated by your Spirit, would begin in each of our hearts. For we pray this in the great and mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
stand amazed I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean so I could sing out Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, what a gift uh, to be here together as the church and to ring in uh, and set the tone for a new year. Uh, we do have, if you're a guest with us and first time guest, Miss Shannon would love to bless you with something. And if you didn't get enough sweets for the Christmas season, this would be a great chance for you to, to walk away with some. If you're a guest, we're so glad uh, you're here. You won't want to miss Miss Joy's cookies. So um, yeah, they're, they're good. Um, I don't have any more room uh, in my belt to make room for anything else, but I hope you do if you're a guest with us. Uh, a couple of announcements before we go. One of those is that tonight we have Discover New Year, so it's kind of a family-friendly uh, worship service from 5 to 7 in here. We'll eat. Uh, we'll drop the ball at 7 o'clock so you don't have to stay up, uh, which is awesome. Uh, that's my kind of New Year's, uh, and, and so that'll be a lot of fun uh, tonight. Again, you're welcome. We'd love to have you here, uh, and I 
think we'll probably need to take up chairs, right, Jason? So if you're able-bodied, uh, we, we gave you time back today. We're 10 minutes early, so that's like a Christmas miracle, all right? So, um, and so just also, if you have children that are in godly play right now, if you would have conversation for a few minutes and go over there by 11 o'clock, I know they'll be, they'll be done by that time. Um, and I think that would be, they, they can get, they have a longer story today. So I know picking them up at 11 would be a gift to them. So, um, but I hope to see you next week. We'll be gathering and we'll have all three of our worship services picking up next Sunday. And again, we'll be celebrating kind of a Wesleyan Covenant service, which is just a way to begin the year with kind of that right heart and perspective uh, on the Lord and, and desiring and pursuing him and serving him. And so excited about that. And of course, we'll, we'll celebrate that with communion, which will be a great Sunday. So uh, grateful for the chance to continue worshiping through this year with you. Um, but as we go, uh, we've heard the good news in Jesus. We have this one who has come to embrace our sorrows, but one who reigns in glory and who will reign forevermore. And my prayer is that we leave uh, ready to serve and to give ourselves to this one um, who we know to be so good and full of grace. May we be the embodiment of his love and of the hope of the good news. Amen.